During the height of the Cold War, 1945 to 1989, a very unusual train passed from West Germany to the isolated city of West Berlin, carrying Allied military personnel. This train passed through the territory of East Germany and through zones controlled by the Soviet army and Soviet garrisons, effectively enemy territory. In this video, I'm going to tell a story of the British military train Berlin, otherwise known by its nickname, the Berliner or the Cold War Express. We'll start by stepping back in time to the year 1981 to a BBC current affairs news item. It is a strange train that each day pulls out of the station in West Germany. Its few passengers are locked inside. It carries no freight. It defies the logic of cost, owing its existence to the tensions between East and West. For this is a British military train which since 1945 has crossed East Germany daily, insisting by its presence on maintaining a rail corridor with West Berlin. 36 years ago, the purpose of this train was to supply British forces in Berlin. But today, its role is to assert a right, namely the freedom of access to the city of West Berlin. And if for any reason this train was denied passage through East Germany, there would be an international incident. For this train is part of the delicate web of relationships between the East and the West. The train owes its existence to a unique set of circumstance and diplomatic agreements made during the last months of World War II. With the defeat of National Socialist Germany inevitable, the leaders of the Allied powers met in Yalta, USSR, to decide how a defeated and occupied Germany should be governed. It was decided in Yalta to split Germany into occupation zones, each governed by the nation that had captured that territory. The German capital Berlin was treated as a special case and would be further subdivided into city occupation zones by each Allied power. But soon after the end of World War II, tensions developed rapidly between the Western powers and the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. Former allies quickly became enemies in a few short years. Because of this, there was stark divergence between how the US and British zones and the Soviet zone was governed. Liberal free democracy in the West and communism in the East. From the late 1940s during the early 1950s, the occupation zones developed into separate sovereign countries. The Allied zones in the West became the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, and the Soviet zone became the Deutsche Democratic Republic, or German Democratic Republic, otherwise known as East Germany. Berlin, however, remained a special case because of its unique circumstance. It remained split into four occupation zones with West Berlin becoming a separate city-state and East Berlin becoming the capital of East Germany. In 1961, though, in response to a deteriorating security situation, mass exodus of East German citizens to the West and tensions between West and East, overnight, East Germany sealed the inner German border and sealed off West Berlin. Over the next 20 years, West Berlin effectively became a walled-in democratic island in the centre of East Germany. The inner German border itself, the border between East and West Germany, became the most fortified border region in the world, with 850 miles of fences, walls, gun and observation towers and minefields. The Soviets and East German governments really wanted total control of Berlin and they wanted the expulsion of the Western Allied military forces from West Berlin. So they made access to West Berlin as difficult as possible. From 1950 onwards, transit to West Berlin by the Western military powers by air was unlimited, but access by road and rail was very, very strictly controlled by the Soviets and the East German forces. It was in this completely hostile and threatening military environment that the British Army began running a military passenger service train between West Germany and West Berlin. It became known quickly as the Berliner or the British military train. And in this video, I'm going to follow the route of the Berliner through the present day Germany and tell you some of the stories and some of the procedures in how we use the train back in the 1980s. Hi there, welcome to the town of Braunschweig in Niedersachsen, Germany. So the British military train ran from Braunschweig through to Helmstedt, across the inner German border into the DDR, East Germany, through East Germany, 
and then into West Berlin, terminating at Charlottenburg S-Bahn station in West Berlin. So if you are a British military or a dependent, you would have to come to this place, Braunschweig, to uh, board the train, in particular to the Hauptbahnhof. So let me show you the next step in the process. Now, you couldn't just buy a ticket for the Berlin military train. The first thing you would need is authority, and you would need one of these documents, an Allied Military Movement Order, or known in Russian as a Butevka. You could quite easily obtain one of these through your movements office, but you would need a justified military purpose to go to Berlin. However, social visits were acceptable. Once your movement order was all signed off, then your unit movements office could book you onto the Berliner. This wouldn't cost you a penny, all expenses were met by the military. You would then, within seven days, get your tickets in the mail. If you had a short notice movement, then you could pick your tickets up from the station at the RTO office. Your tickets arrived in the mail in this folder, which is quite handy, and contained a schematic map of the journey. The Berliner made two journeys a day. In the morning, from Berlin to Braunschweig, and then in the afternoon, from Braunschweig back to Berlin. For this video, we're just going to follow the Braunschweig to Berlin route. So let's get started. As a guide for you, I'm going to use the map that came with the tickets as a schematic to show you the progress of our journey. Here we are, right at the beginning of our journey at Braunschweig Hauptbahnhof. In the present day, Braunschweig Hauptbahnhof looks little changed from when it was built in the 1970s. Of course, being military, we had to use the tradesman's entrance. OK, so this is where your unit transport would drop you off. Not out the front, out the back of the trade's entrance. The rear car park to Braunschweig helps barn off. From here, it's a quick walk up to Platform 8 to go and report to the RTO's office. The rear concourse was remodelled in the year 2020, but this route by foot will be familiar to anyone who's used the Berliner back in the 1970s and 1980s, including dragging your luggage up the steps to Platform 8. At the end of Platform 8, you reported to this building, the British Army Rail Transport Officer's Office, or RTO's office, a very scruffy concrete prefab building. Inside, you would find a very bored Royal Corps of Transport clerk who would check your ID card, take your Allied movement order off you, and issue your tickets if you didn't already have them. You had to do this at least 30 minutes before departure, or you would get shouted at by the train conducting warrant officer. Today on Platform 8, the RTO shed has long gone and the platform has been completely modernised. The British military train consisted of up to 10 1960s era carriages, each carriage festooned with an enormous Union Jack and stenciled with property of the British Army on the side. The train layout consisted of first class carriages for officers, second class carriages for other ranks, a dining carriage, a kitchen carriage and a command and security carriage for the staff. Generally, on a run, each train would carry up to 180 passengers. Obviously, on each carriage window was this sign, because the use of binos and cameras when going through East Germany was strictly forbidden. Today, though, I'll be using Deutsche Bahn RB40 to Magdeburg to simulate the route of the Berliner. Fortunately for me though, 30 years on, the RB40 is much more comfortable and scenic than the Berliner. And also, our guards are not going to chain and padlock the doors. Also, an advantage of travelling 30 years later is that unlike the Berliner, the Deutsche Regional Bahn trains are double-decker. So of course, I've opted for the top deck for the scenic view of the German countryside on our route. At exactly 1600 hours, the Berliner would depart Braunschweig and set sail for East Germany and finally towards Berlin. Point I need to make now is that the British military did not own the locomotive, the prime mover. We had to borrow that from the Deutsche Bahn in West Germany or the Deutsche Reichsbahn in East Germany. But more about that in a minute. After 24 minutes traveling eastwards through West Germany, the Berliner would make its first stop at the frontier town of Helmstedt. You couldn't get out of the train here, remember, the doors are chained and padlocked shut. But I've jumped off the RB40 just to film a panorama of the modern station for your interest. The reason we've stopped at Helmstedt is to change locomotive, because this is as far east as a Deutsche Bahn locomotive can travel. 
Its peculiar ways are fashioned by the Cold War. At the border, the West German engine is uncoupled to be replaced by a Soviet-designed diesel with an East German driver. The East German train driver and his guard were very heavily vetted individuals by the East German Stasi and were considered completely trustworthy. They were also family men and this prevented them from defecting to the West. With our East German locomotive hooked up, the Berliner and our present day substitute, the RB40, can now depart Helmstedt for the inner German border fortifications, which are just two miles eastwards. From Helmstedt Bahnhof to the inner German border will take you about four to five minutes, but the train would not stop at the border. The border itself is marked only by control towers and barbed wire. I'll correct the BBC here, the wire and towers were always well inside East Germany and not actually on the border. To illustrate this, here is a photograph of the Berliner travelling eastwards from Helmstedt. The locomotive is about to enter the border fortification funnel and carriages one and two are in the DDR. However, the rest of the train is still in West Germany. The border between East Germany and West Germany is marked by this DDR coloured pole here. If you're sat at the left hand side of the train as you approach the border, you would see this landmark, this tower on the hill. So I feel a side quest coming on. Although viewed from the train at a distance, it does look like an East German watchtower. This is actually a tower that dates from 1400 and it is known as the Magdeburg Warte Tower. Okay, so this isn't anything really to do with the train journey, but I've wanted to do this for about 35 years. I'm going to simulate crossing between West Germany and East Germany if the old inner German border still existed. So, for orientation behind me is the Magdeburg Warte Tower, which sits about 5-10 metres inside West Germany. Behind me, as I pan round to the left, if I go that right about there now, is the Gedenkstein, which replaced the West German border warning signs. So we're going to walk now across the border into East Germany. To illustrate how close the tower was to the inner German border back in the day, and this is actually the reason I brought you up here, this is a photograph from about 1987 of a face-off between a West German border guard on the left by the tower and two DDR border troops on the right. To make it easy for you, let me shade in East Germany red. And this photograph is another interaction between West German and East German border guards in exactly the same place. Note how both nationalities' guards are armed, but their guns are slung, so they perceive no threat from each other. This photograph is interesting because you can note the West German border sign on the white pole and also the DDR border marker pole. And in the background, you can just about pick out a BT-9 watch and gun tower, which, which is where the fortifications start. OK, and here we are then in East Germany. I have to keep saying former because obviously after reunification, it's all one country. Just to show you how close I was to West Germany, let me just pan round. I'm in East now and I'll show you back facing. I'm facing East and you're now facing West and you can see the tower and the Gedenkstein. Obviously, the inner German border fortifications have all gone and I'll show you some historic photographs of what they look like in this area. This photo dates from circa 1990 because it simply wouldn't have been possible to take before the collapse of the Berlin Wall in November 1989. Here we can see the BT-9 watching gun tower from the previous scene, about 100 metres east of the Magdeburg Warte Tower. You can also see the security fence. Just to prove a point, pushing on past the border warning signs, you would come to the inner German border defences. And here we are about 60 metres east of the Magdeburg Warte Tower. The fence is gone, so have the SM-70 mines, but the concrete uh, patrol track for Grenz Troop and patrol vehicles is still here. And this would run the entire length of the inner German border and what was known as the Death Strip. Still here after 35 years. With our side quest to the Magdeburg Warte Tower complete, we return to the Berliner, just as it enters the border fortification funnel. And this is a view of the train border crossing point. The border itself is a strip wood in the foreground, and you can see the East German security fence forms a sort of funnel around the train tracks as it crosses the border. This funnel was about 500 metres long, over which was a gantry stroke observation stroke gun tower crewed by the Grenz Truppen. 
This funnel made it impossible for an East German citizen to make a break for the border along the train track. They simply would not have made it. Another view of the same area, but this time at ground level, taken after 1990. This is a view of a train travelling east through the funnel, and you can see the gun gantry in the background. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, obviously now it's not manned anymore. Back in the day, the Berliner would not stop at the border, but it would slow down considerably. But it wouldn't get far, because it would be stopping five minutes later in the village of Marienborn. About five minutes after crossing the inner German border fortifications, the Berliner would slow down and then finally stop at a village called Marienborn. And if this was your first time in East Germany, it would feel like you'd step back 30 years in time. About five minutes after crossing into East Germany from Helmstedt, you're going to arrive at this place, Marienborn. The train is going to stop and things are about to get interesting because this is the place where the Soviet army conduct their security check on the British military train. Let me show you the procedure. Because of the agreements in Yalta and the Potsdam Treaty from 1945, the East Germans had absolutely no authority over the British military train. They could not board it and they could not search it. Only the Soviets had the power to do that. But this didn't prevent them from running a search dog around the wheels and the underside looking for clandestines, particularly when the train was passing from east to west. The East Germans though could search the locomotive and they did, but they had to uncouple it first so it wasn't technically part of the British military train. The reason the locomotive was being searched was nothing to do with security. It was to ensure that the East German driver and his guard were not bringing in prohibited goods from the West to sell on the black market. It was possible that you might find a uniformed DDR intelligence officer wandering along the platform with a camera taking photographs through the windows of the train. This was, and indeed, a rare occurrence, because generally the Soviet station commanding officers consider it poor military etiquette. And it was only likely if a Stasi spy in Braunschweig in West Germany had spotted a VIP boarding the train and communicated that forward. Concurrently, while this was all going on, the formal train clearance ceremony would take place. The British train commanding officer, the train conducting one officer, and the army Russian translator would all alight the train and form up in a single rank facing down the platform. The Soviet station commander and his escort of two soldiers would exit the Soviet office and do likewise. The British would then formally march up to the Soviet contingent and halt in front of them. In this photograph, the commanding officer is in the centre. The train conducting one officer is on the left, holding a briefcase containing the train's documents, and the specially trained Russian translator is on the right. A quaint ceremony will occur which is not permitted to be filmed. While the passengers take tea, three British officers march down a platform, salute their Soviet counterparts, who examine documents before allowing the train to proceed. The British train commanding officer was usually a captain on rotation from the Berlin garrison. It would generally change every day, because commanding the Berliner was a boost to their military CV. The permanent staff member was a train conducting warrant officer. He was a long service warrant officer, usually on a two-year tour on the train. The translator was a non-commissioned officer who had completed a two-year Russian language course at Beaconsfield in the UK. The Soviet station commander was usually a captain or major, a career officer in the Soviet army, on a two-year posting to Marienborn. After halting in front of each other, the Russian and British commissioned officers would salute each other. And it was customary for the British officer to greet his Soviet counterpart in Russian and for the Soviet officer to reply in English, after which the Russian translator took over. The Soviet officer shook the hands of all British personnel and then would invite them into the Soviet station office for hospitality while a Soviet military clerk examined all the moving orders and the documents for the train. This check could take between 15 and 45 minutes. Now, if you've watched my videos on the Autobahn corridor through East Germany from Checkpoint Alpha to Checkpoint Bravo, you'll know that the Soviets could mess service people around crossing through the corridor, something rotten at both checkpoints or even send you back or detain you. And if it wasn't for the Soviets, then it was the East German Volkspolizei, the VOPO, that would mess with you en route. Now, if you used the train, none of that ever happened. And I don't think, and I'm prepared to be corrected here, the train was ever once interfered with by the Soviet forces from 1945 to 1991. 
If you were delayed at Barrenborn, it wasn't for a security check or security purposes. It was because the Soviet commanding officer at the station was sharing foot good shots with the train commanding officer and the training conducting warrant officer and the Russian translator and would insist on several shots before the train was allowed to leave. The relations between the British forces and the Soviets at Barrenborn was absolutely always excellent. Quite understandably, in the 35 years uh, since the end of the Cold War, Marienborn Rail Station has been completely remodelled and modernised and is now a modern high-speed rail link. There are still some remnants of the old border station here and I'll show you them now. Marienborn today is a very modern German village, but the old 1900 era station house still stands but it is in a very pitiful condition. Sadly, there's not much left of the pre-war Bahnhof it's all been uh, left to rack and ruin because a new station has been built. The East German security building is still present, but that's further up the track, and I'll show you that in a second. If you're a British military trained veteran, I think you're going to be disappointed at the state of Marimore Station now because it was quite a picturesque little East German railway halt back in the day. This is how the East German Marienborn station and platforms looked 30 years ago before reunification. Compare that to today's modern high-speed Marienborn station. If you do look hard though at Marienborn, you can still find some Cold War remnants. For example, the East German Reichsbahn passenger shelters have been recycled and used on the new station. If the names Helmstedt and Marienborn sound familiar to you, that's because two miles north of this rail station is the principal road portal between East and West Germany, and a vast border station in the DDR called, likewise, Marienborn. If you're interested, check out my video on crossing the border between East and West by car in the top right hand corner. With formalities complete and a certain amount of vodka drunk, Soviet authority to proceed will be given and the train will now pull away from Marienborn past the East German border station, which today is all derelict, and have a clear run into Berlin. Once the train was clear of Marienborn, the best part of using the Berliner would commence, the formal dinner service. Now generally officers in first class would be called forward to dine first, but each table in the dining car was filled as it became vacant, so first and second class could mix in the dining car. For the passengers, soldiers and their families, it's a kind of military Brighton Bell, china and starch tablecloths. The dinner, which is elaborately prepared, costs 62 pence, chilled wine 80 pence, a charge which until recently had been fixed by international agreement. The food on the Berliner was absolutely amazing and this was very deliberate. If you were travelling out from Berlin in the morning, you would be served a breakfast and then a luncheon. And if you are taking the route we are now, back to Berlin in the afternoon and evening, you will be served a full dinner course. There was also a separate wine list, and this was all served by silver service waiters. The British Army contracted the fine dining catering and the silver service out to the prestigious Compagnie Internationale der Wagenslips, based in Paris, at a huge expense to the defence budget, and a notional cost to the passenger themselves. In the present day, that same company provides the same silver service and fine dining catering for the Orient Express as it did for the Berliner. So why was there such elaborate and expensive catering on the Berliner, which is essentially just a troop transit train? Well, two reasons. Firstly, British military tradition, which I'll explain, and also, more importantly, political and military one-upmanship over the Soviet occupation forces in East Germany, i.e. you feed your soldiers on cabbage soup, look how we feed our soldiers. The traditional element of it comes from the military class system. Starting hundreds of years ago, it's always been a British military tradition to maintain social etiquette and, where possible, formally die in the face of the enemy. For example, during World War I, officers would often have a formal dinner in their command dugout in the trenches. This tradition might seem ludicrous to outsiders, and it was brilliantly parodied in the 1968 comedy movie Carry On Up the Khyber where the officers and their guests died in black tie and mess dress while the fort is being bombarded by enemy forces. About two hours into the journey, we would approach the city of Magdeburg. Now, Magdeburg was a Soviet garrison town during the Cold War, 
and it was surrounded by tank training areas. So therefore it was possible to observe our enemy practicing their armoured warfare skills from the train windows. Sadly, because cameras were obviously bad on the Berliner, I can't find any photographs to show you of the Soviet tank training areas and the garrison tank parks. In the present day though, the twin spires of Magdeburg Cathedral should be familiar to any Berliner train veteran. Back in the day though, because the train would need to cross a number of tracks across a number of points across the station, this would normally require a five minute administrative halt at Magdeburg Hauptbahnhof. Magdeburg Hauptbahnhof is another station that has received much investment and remodelling since reunification, because it was a fairly shabby, dismal place back during the Cold War. At the halt, nobody was permitted to exit the train, and the train doors remained chained and padlocked shut. There was also no Soviet army presence at the station, so that gave the East German Stasi another opportunity to have a bit of intelligence gathering. So it wasn't unusual to see a character like this loitering around the platforms, taking photographs of the train. Of course, he was just an innocent train spotter. And no, this isn't a parody. This photograph is taken directly from a Stasi covert surveillance training pamphlet as an example of how to blend in as a tourist. Thankfully, the halt at Magdeburg was brief. And generally, you'd be in a siding, you wouldn't necessarily be next to a platform, although that did happen, because another of the strict rules of the Berliner were you were completely forbidden from communicating with any East German citizens. As the Berliner pulls away from Magdeburg, about five minutes later, you would cross a very important geographic feature, and a historical one of that, the Elbe River. Because it was the Elbe River where the Western Allies and the Soviet Red Army advancing from East and West linked up in the last weeks of World War II. From crossing the Elbe, it was about a 45 minute run to the outskirts of Berlin and the next stop. Potsdam was the East German city which sat right up next to West Berlin. The Berliner was required to halt at Potsdam station and the East German locomotive was uncoupled and replaced with a West German locomotive very much like the process that we did at Helmstedt. Nobody exited the train and the doors remained padlocked shut, very much like at Marienborn, the DDR forces had no power to search the train, although they did throw a dog around the tracks to look for clandestines hiding in the undercarriage. It's worth pointing out, what's happened so far, the train had three armed guards, which were private soldiers detailed from the Berlin Brigade each armed with a L1A1 self-loading rifle and 10 rounds of ammunition to prevent any train incursion, although this was symbolic more than anything else. After swapping locomotives at Potsdam, it was now a quick 20 minute run into our final destination. However, at Gripnitze, the Berliner crossed from East Germany into West Germany through the Berlin Wall fortifications. The train didn't stop, but it did slow down as it went through the funnel. So, just like before, I'm going to stop here and go on a side quest to show you the Berlin Wall remnants. This is Grubnitzer Station in 1989. And in the top left-hand corner of the photograph, you can see the Berlin Wall and a BT 4x4 watchtower facing West Berlin. Grubnitzer Station today is fairly run down, but from it, you can look northwest up towards what would have been the Berlin Wall funnel into West Berlin. This is a present day view of the border wall funnel. The white arrows indicate the boundary between West Berlin and East Germany back in the day, or in the present day, the boundary between the city of Berlin and the city of Potsdam. Here we can see the Berliner crossing through the funnel, um, looking the opposite direction from where I've just showed you to complicate things. This is a view from the west towards the east. I think it'll be better if I show you myself. And this is the point where the train would cross from East Germany into West Berlin, the exact point of the border crossing. Now today, it doesn't look much with the Harris fencing and the undergrowth. So it's probably better if I take you 25 meters back into the East and show you the demarcation line between West Berlin and East Germany on the road, where there's a bit more to see. This signpost, shows you the start of the Berlin city limits, but it also would have been the point during the Cold War, this would have been the start of West Berlin and the end of East Germany. Let me show you around the site quickly. Even though the border fortifications and the wall have long gone, you can see the exact line of the border 
because of the different styles of cobbles between West Berlin and Potsdam. Once we start our train journey again, we're going to cross a rail bridge over a waterway known as uh, Grebnitze. Probably pronounced that wrong, don't have a go with me. That waterway is directly behind me now. So I thought I'd bring you to this little outcrop of land just before we do that, just before the rail bridge. Because it's been left as a Berlin Wall Memorial. And behind me you can see two sections of the wall being left in place. In a minute I'll show you around where the watchtower would have been and a memorial to the two lads that were shot trying to cross by the rail station. Imagine if you were an East German now, this is as close to West Berlin as you can get. And there are houses in front of me now with a view over the wall and into West Berlin. Let's take a tour of this little site. This is the same section of Gribnitze, photographed in 1989. And you can see that the Berlin Wall runs the full length of the eastern bank of the waterway. Back in the present day, I'm stood on the site of a former BT-9 watch and gun tower. And you can see its foundations. In front of me is a preserved section of the Berlin Wall with a cross that's been left as a memorial to the three East German lads who were shot trying to cross the Berlin Wall near here. Two were shot uh, separate times trying to cross the wall and one was shot trying to make his way down the train tracks to West Berlin. With our second side quest complete, I rejoin the Berliner as it passes into West Berlin and the train is now back on friendly territory. There are no West German checks to complete and the train will not halt at the actual border. It's now a quick 10-15 minute run to our final destination. After four hours of travelling through East Germany, i.e. enemy territory, the Berliner finally terminates at Berlin Charlottenburg S-Bahn Station, Platform A, at approximately 1945 hours. Once the train arrives and is stationary, it's like the end of any other train journey around the world. Nothing special. The armed guards will unpadlock and unchain the doors and you are free to leave and continue your journey. Now that could either be picking up the Berlin military shuttle bus that goes around all the barracks in West Berlin, getting a taxi or getting an S and U-Bahn to your final destination. The choice was up to you. Back in the day at Platform A, the following morning, the Berliner would depart yet again for West Germany and the cycle would start for another 24 hours. Platform A today is Platform 1 at Berlin Charlottenburg Station and the signpost for the RTO's office and a British military train, unfortunately, has long gone. Actually, the rear access to Berlin Charlottenburg s Station really hasn't changed much in 30 years and it will be familiar to anybody who's used the Berliner before. However, I'm going to go out the front and get a taxi to my hotel in the centre of Berlin. It's also strange to think that what took us four hours during the Cold War can now be achieved with an intercity train from Berlin Hauptbahnhof to Braunschweig in just 48 minutes. And here we are then, at the end of the line. This is the end of the journey for the British military train. Arriving at Platform A at Berlin Charlottenburg Station, or as it is today, Platform 1. From here, you disembark the train and uh, get your unit transport or the S&U bond to your barracks on Marikorps estate. If you're a senior officer, you'd get picked up by a car. Well, that's it. That's the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed this Cold War journey with me. As ever, if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe because it really does help me out with the algorithm. Thanks for staying with me for this train journey. All the best. Goodbye.